Hello, we're now going to talk about some troubleshooting techniques to do with hardware, including identifying faults, how you can investigate faults, and what sort of documentation might get used. So first of all, word troubleshooting may not be totally obvious what that is. So troubleshooting is finding and fixing issues. Two parts to it, you've got to find the issue first of all, and then of course try and fix it. And as you'll know, lots and lots and lots of IT jobs are based around tr troubleshooting, people supporting either people in the company or customers to try and find and fix errors. And it's not an easy job, right? It, it can be difficult to even find the issue in the first place, let alone go and fix it. And so it's useful to go through some formal fault management. So the sort of steps you need to go through if you are working in hardware troubleshooting. The first step is to figure out what the problem is, right? So this might be really obvious, it might not be obvious. This isn't trying to figure out what exactly is causing it yet. We're just trying to see what the end result is. So often this will involve asking the user if it's yourself, well, you would have noticed the problem. So it's just seeing what the end result is. But then afterwards, you've got to try and figure out what the cause of this problem is. And that can be tricky. And you might try and predict this, so you may not know for sure. Usually you won't know for sure until you actually try and fix it. So you are only predicting. And you might be able to get at the cause for using particular tools, such as installable tools, and we'll go through some in a minute or two, but also just generally trial and error. I've always found, you know, tr tr you know, looking at each hardware component individually can be useful. You might be able to unplug an expansion card or unplug one of your storage devices, whatever it is, and try them one by one to figure out the cause. That can take a while, of course. And the third step, much easier said than done, but you try and then solve the problem. So that might be, in many cases, replacing the hardware component you've, you've thought caused the issue. And then you've got to test it, right? If you are working in troubleshooting, you can't just give back the computer after the third step. You've got to try and see if it's fixed or not. Now, in a formal place, you might use a test plan. If it's just you, you might not. But a test plan is a document where you are writing down what test you are trying, what was the result, if the result wasn't what you expected, you'd write down that and you'd also write down what you were doing to try and fix that issue. So it's a really formal document stating what the tests were. And finally, assuming it was fixed, you will document it. So again, you should be writing down what exactly went wrong and how you fixed it. Because in the future, you might save time by reading your documentation. Equally, somebody else on your team might save time by reading your documentation. So writing logs might be what you're doing. A log is a record of problems and solutions. This can be quite formal in a formal document. It could just be jotting down to yourself what went wrong. But that is quite important because issues happen again and again. You might lose track of what the issue is um, unless you keep a written record of it. And of course, at step four, if a test didn't work, if a problem wasn't fixed, it would be your job to go back to step two and predict another cause and find a different way to try and solve it. Often this will take a few steps, a few loops, because it can be hard to fix these issues straight away. So those five steps are more or less what you need to go through. But just to slightly summarize that process with a few common issues you might come across, just to give some examples and to give some examples of some tools. Well, quite a common problem which I've come across a few times in my life, is there being weirdly quite poor graphics or sound performance. You might have a really expensive graphics card and the quality is really bad or the game you're trying to play is really laggy and you're not quite sure why. This can sometimes be caused um, by you not plugging in to the correct port. So I'm thinking of my dad, for example, bought a really expensive computer and plugged in his monitor cable into the motherboard and not into his expensive graphics card. So in a desktop computer, there'll be lots of ports. You've got to make sure it's going into the correct one, uh, in particular your expansion card, not your motherboard. So that's a, that's a simple example of just cables not being in the right place. Another very uh, stressful problem is your computer not booting. You try and turn it on and nothing happens. So in terms of investigation, what you might do 
is use a tool called POST. POST stands for Power On Self Test, and it's what you see when you turn on the computer. So just before it boots the OS, you see usually a flash of a black screen, usually your motherboard company, and it might give you a message like here it says, CPU fan speed error detected. And it gives an advice on how to fix this error. So POST will run some tests, it will diagnose some problems if there are any problems, and just by looking at that screen, you are able to hopefully fix it. So you might have to take a photo, you might be able to pause it, press F1 to run a, a setup menu, um, a few different steps involved. But also occasionally, it might not boot at all. You might never see that screen. If the issue was with your graphics card, for example, you might never see that screen. So instead, a lot of motherboards have a mini speaker plugged in. And some people see that in their expensive computer and think, what is the point of having a tiny speaker? Like, what benefit does that give? Well, what it does, if you can't even turn on a computer, this may beep. And you might have heard of a computer turning on and beeping. The beeping is indicating an error. And the number of beeps is an error code. So you can Google, you know, five beeps, what does that mean? So it's a way of giving you an error message even without you seeing it on screen because if the issue is with your monitor or with your graphics card, having a nice menu is not very useful. So POST can be good at finding errors with booting. And then of course, whatever information you've gained from POST, you can then replace or fix the broken component. To give another example of a common error, well, another scary one is a stop error. So a stop error more informally is called the blue screen of death. It was what I showed in the first slide. Blue screen of death is just a sudden error message before your computer crashes. Often you lose what you're working on at that point. And this can be caused by lots of it, lots of uh, different things, loads of things really. And so your investigation might involve looking up the error code because usually on this crash screen, it'll give you a code. You can look it up, maybe online, maybe in a manual, so a written document, and you might be able to look up what the error means and it might even give some suggestions on how to fix it. To give a couple more examples, and these are all ones which happened to me, that's why I'm giving them, because I've had to come across this myself. Well, I had a while ago an issue with my laptop where it would suddenly crash out of nowhere. You'd be mid-task and the laptop would just crash with no warning, no blue screen of death, just a, a sudden crash, it would have to restart after that point. Now, my investigation was quite a short one, I figured out after a while that it happened when lots of programs were open at a time. So I had loads and loads of tabs up, loads of programs open, which meant my RAM was full, it was at full capacity. There was no space to store more stuff. And so when I opened more programs, it caused a RAM to overflow in effect and crash the computer. So the fix was to increase the RAM capacity. So it was an issue with hardware, kind of, Nothing wrong with the RAM, it just wasn't big enough, I found. And another error which, actually I say these happen to me, this hasn't happened to me, it's a bit of an old fashioned one nowadays, but still can come up in exams. Now, this is not old fashioned because computers can be slow all the time, but slow running computers can be caused by an issue with your hard drive. And hard drives are not used as much, that's why I say they are a little bit old fashioned. So you might think, well actually, are most items in this very slow computer stored on a hard drive? And if they are, it could be a sign that the hard drive is fragmented. And so what you might do is run a defragmentation tool on the hard drive and that might well speed it up quite a lot. Of course, you could also replace it with an SSD. That would fix it permanently. But defragmentation is a tool you can mention in an exam. So the idea is, over time, on a hard drive, when you delete stuff, when you add new files, when you add new data, things start to get separated. So here I'm using colors to represent different programs and data, but over time it's getting scattered. Right, the kind of yellowy orange one is kind of separated in four places, the other orange one's in two places, purple is together. But the point is, as stuff gets separated, every time you want to access these two oranges, you've got to go to multiple locations. So if you imagine that disk spinning really fast, it's got to go to different areas of the disk to access the data. 
This takes longer. If you're having to go to multiple locations to get data, that takes longer. Ideally, they'll be all together in one block because you've only got to read it once or write it once. So stuff getting scattered, fragmented, is not a good thing. And it happens over time. So what you could do is run a defragmentation tool. What this does is rearrange the data so it is stored together in clusters. So I'll put it so that ideally all of the data is stored together or at least much closer together. This speeds up the disk, um, it speeds up your reading, it speeds up your writing because you haven't got to go to multiple locations, it's all together and much more organized. This doesn't really happen with SSDs, there's not really a bad effect, only really happens with magnetic hard drives.